Hunter Biden is on Capitol Hill right now under oath, finally facing a congressional inquiry into his actions. Will he lie? Will he take the fifth? We'll give you all the details and speculate a little bit because, after all, it's behind closed doors. We're not sure what's going on. Plus, meanwhile, his dad is heading over to the hospital for a physical. Will he lie? Will he take the fifth? Will he actually submit himself for a cognitive test? And will you ever actually know the results? Plus, Fannie Willis's boy toys divorce lawyer. Looks like he's in hot water and may have lied under oath, or maybe all of them are lying under oath. Either way, this is the clown car responsible for trying to jail Donald Trump. What the hell is going on in this country? That and a whole lot more coming up right now. I'm Larry O'Connor. Call me Larry. We're rumbling away live on Rumble right now because it's noon Eastern time. Make sure you check in with us every single day right at this time and tell a friend that audience at Rumble is growing. Subscribe, like our channel and keep coming back for more, please. Also, if you'd like to take us on the go and you can't necessarily watch us because you're driving, listen to the podcast. Subscribe, please. Leave some reviews, leave some ratings. You can get us at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you like your podcast. Go ahead and subscribe. It's Larry with Town Hall Media. As we speak, literally just in the last 10 minutes, it has been announced on the floor of the Senate, and we'll play the video for you in just a sec. Mitch McConnell, the majority leader, longtime majority leader for the Republicans, the senator from Kentucky, will be stepping down as majority leader. Uh, Spencer Brown over at Town Hall has the story. Following a record run as the Republican leader in the United States Senate, Mitch McConnell stepping aside from that leadership post this November, according to reporting from the Associated Press, he was first elected to the U.S. Senate in 1984. McConnell, currently the 13th longest serving member of the Senate in U.S. history. The Kentucky Republican is also the longest serving Senate party leader in the country's history. After becoming the Republican whip in 2003, McConnell rose to the position of minority leader from 2007 to 15, majority leader from 15 to 21. And then again, as minority leader since 2021. And uh, here's what it looked like on the floor of the U.S. Senate when Mitch McConnell made the surprising remarks. Uh, nobody saw this coming, actually. Uh, here's what he had to say. Republican leader. As, as some of you may know, this has been a particularly difficult time for my family. We tragically lost Elaine's younger sister, Angela, just a few weeks ago. When you lose a loved one, particularly at a young age, there's a certain introspection that accompanies the grieving process. Perhaps it is God's way of reminding you of your own life's journey to reprioritize the impact of the world that we will all inevitably leave behind. I turned 82 last week, <clears throat> the end of my contributions are closer than I'd prefer. My career in the United States Senate began amidst the Reagan revolution. The truth is when I got here, I was just happy if anybody remembered my name. President Reagan called me Mitch O'Donnell. Close enough, I thought. My life, my wife Elaine and I got married on President Reagan's birthday, February 6th. It's probably not the most romantic thing to admit, but Reagan meant a lot to both of us. For 31 years, Elaine has been the love of my life, and I'm eternally grateful to have her by my side. I think back to my first days in the Senate with deep appreciation for the time that helped shape my view of the world. I'm unconflicted about the good within our country and the irreplaceable role we play as the leader of the free world. It's why I worked so hard to get the national security package passed 
earlier this month. Believe me, I know the politics within my party at this particular moment in time. I have many faults. Misunderstanding politics is not one of them. That said, I believe more strongly than ever that America's global leadership is essential to preserving the shining city on a hill that Ronald Reagan discussed. As long as I'm drawing breath on this earth, I will defend American exceptionalism. So as I've been thinking about when I would deliver some news to the Senate, I always imagined a moment when I had total clarity and peace about the sunset of my work. A moment when I'm certain I have helped preserve the ideals I so strongly believe. That day arrived today. All right, and there you have it, Mitch McConnell's uh, farewell address, at least the announcement, I should say, to the United States Senate. He'll still give other addresses to the Senate between now and November, where he will officially step down as majority leader. If you're wondering, his term actually as a U.S. senator goes through 2027, uh, so he can still stay in the Senate for as long as he'd like. Uh, should President Trump win the presidency, he will most definitely have a different majority leader to work with, and um, that's probably news to President Trump's ears. He's made no secret of the fact that he was displeased with Mitch McConnell's performance and his most recent priorities. In fact, I have to say, it's disconcerting that at this valedictory moment where Mitch McConnell can look back on his career, where all eyes are on him as he announces his uh, intention to step down, that he doesn't take a moment and actually address his greatest legacy as majority leader of the United States Senate. Instead, he talks about our global role, the internationalism. The, listen, I agree that we're a shining city on the hill. I agree that there is American exceptionalism. I agree that America is called to be a world leader. If we're not the world leader, certainly another country will step into that vacuum, and it ain't going to be Luxembourg. So I get that. But why continue to emphasize the global nature of your responsibilities as a U.S. senator, when in fact Mitch McConnell has one of the greatest domestic legacies that truly will be part of his epitaph. For better or for worse, I, I can assure you, conservatives and freedom-loving Americans will, despite our concerns about Mitch McConnell and arguments with him at various times, will always celebrate his ability to get federal judges and Supreme Court justices on the bench for Republican presidents, most importantly, the three Supreme Court justices that Donald Trump nominated, thus finally doing away with Roe versus Wade. And even more importantly, in one of the boldest, most courageous political decisions of my lifetime, Mitch McConnell defied the media, defied Democrats, defied the left, and withheld a hearing for Merrick Garland after Barack Obama nominated him to be on the Supreme Court in 2016. The pressure on him was enormous to have a hearing, let alone actually bring that nomination to the floor for a vote. I think that Mitch McConnell deciding not to allow the Merrick Garland nomination go through probably was the single most important political move of the last several decades. Not only did it keep Merrick Garland from the bench, and God knows as we've seen his performance as the attorney general, that is an unbelievably giant bullet that we all dodged as a nation. But it also left that seat open for the political election. Voters in 2016, when casting their ballot for president, knew that they were also casting their ballot for the next justice on the Supreme Court. Selected by Hillary Clinton or selected by Donald Trump? And when Donald Trump then put forth that list of justices, judges, excuse me, that he would select from for that seat, I think that helped Donald Trump seal the conservative vote going into the election, who many conservatives, by the way, at the time, 
were suspicious of Donald Trump, considering his track record as a Democrat and a supporter of Hillary Clinton's and had made statements in support of legalized abortion in the past. Everyone evolves, everyone changes, but you were skeptical. You were suspicious. We have an open Supreme Court seat for this presidential election. Donald Trump says it's going to be one of these guys, ended up being Neil Gorsuch. And well, the rest is history. That is Mitch McConnell's greatest legacy, you ask any conservative. By the way, it's going to be in his epitaph, in his New York Times obituary, uh, from the left's perspective as well, because they hate him for that. They absolutely despise him for that. Why wouldn't you talk about that and brag about it in the first three and a half minutes of this little valedictory speech that you're giving? That's odd, and I don't get it. I don't get why you immediately then lean on the international, global challenges that you think is your job as a United States senator. Oh, I'm, I guess I'll never be a senator because I'll never understand that. Mitch McConnell does have a historic track record, for better or for worse, just by the sake of his longevity. And there will be many things said and written about how he conducted himself. Sadly, though, I think he joined so many other politicians who overstayed and kept on well beyond the time where he could gracefully exit the stage and be most effective. We've seen his health and his capacity deteriorate quite a bit. And he knows, as many politicians know, just like our president knows, that out of deference, no one's going to actually tell the emperor what he's wearing. And everyone just stands around and gives due deference. I'm glad. I'm not sure what brought it on. But I'm glad that Mitch McConnell will now be able to enjoy an easier go at it. And I probably suggest that he should step down from the Senate as well and maybe make way for some fresh blood. And speaking of that, now the sweepstakes to replace him as majority leader begins in earnest. And there are a lot of names of people who would like that job. John Thune, who just incidentally endorsed Donald Trump for president earlier this week, will certainly be a front runner, the senator from South Dakota. You'll also hear see Rick Scott vie for the job, maybe even Ron Johnson from Wisconsin, and maybe some surprises as well. That job is a powerful one, an important one. And if, in fact, the Republicans do gain a majority this November, which I believe they will, and if Donald Trump does win the presidency, which, well, if the election were held today, the polls suggest he will, the majority leader, a brand new majority leader, will be critically important to fixing what's wrong with this country. Happy trails, Mitch McConnell. Let the games begin. Joe Biden today left the White House, headed over into Marine One and took a helicopter ride to Bethesda for Walter Reed Medical Center. He is getting a physical exam. Here's the scene at the White House just a few moments ago. Yeah, I did. don't you wonder what's in the cardboard cup? Why is the president of the United States getting a coffee to go? Or is it tea? Or is it maybe the little energy booster he needs before his cognitive test? Only his doctor knows for sure. Also, look at the little trot here he does. He does this little trot thing all the time. Look how active I am. Oh, I'm spent. Uh, that's your president of the United States. And he is, yes, heading in for his physical, finally. And it was asked of Karine Jean-Pierre earlier whether this physical would involve a cognitive test as well and when you or I might be able to see the results. It seems like just the bare minimum to ask, doesn't it? Um, any updates on when the president's physical might be taking place? So he will have a physical uh, when we uh, when we have uh, information on that. So obviously, we will uh, certainly share that with all of you. It will be transparent. There will be a uh, a, a comprehensive uh, report as. Well. Can I just pause here for a second because this was yesterday. Yesterday, she was asked, "When will the president have a physical?" And she said, "When." We know, we'll let you know, we want to be fully transparent. Are you telling me that the president's schedule is so wide open 
that they basically decided late last night to schedule his physical at Walter Reed. You're telling me that she didn't know about this yesterday while she's talking about how transparent they're going to be? Was this just a last minute decision? Do you know what it takes to get Walter Reed ready for the commander in chief to show up for a physical? What kind of screening has to go on with Secret Service? Yes, it's a secure military hospital. But this is the president of the United States. You're telling me that in advance they didn't already know that this morning he was going for a physical? That's a little odd, isn't it? Uh, when we know, we'll make sure that we tell you in full transparency. Oh, I'm so sorry. That wasn't yesterday? Kevin, interrupt me anytime I make that big of a... When was this then? Let me know. Oh, this was two weeks ago. I so apologize. God, I wish I could start over. I, I'm sorry. It's because Karine Jean-Pierre has, you know, just a couple of different outfits. And I just assumed this was yesterday. All right. So two weeks ago, they were asked about the physical. That makes me feel better. That makes me feel a lot better, in fact, I suppose. Except look at how the exchange goes here in terms of reporters. Again, this is after the Robert Hur statement that said that the president of the United States doesn't have the mental capacity to defend himself in court. And listen to the hostility in this exchange about the president's health and especially his mental health. We have done the last two years, just don't have a, just don't have a timeline for you. Do you plan on the press getting a heads up before the physical happens or will we find out once it has taken place? We're gonna do it the way that we've done it the last two years, it's not gonna be anything different. So the way that we've approached this the last two years will be the same way that we do this uh, and, this year, this third does, year. Does the White House think that the, the idea of the president taking a uh, cognition test, a cognitive test, as a part of this uh, physical, is a legitimate idea, particularly just on the heels of the special counsel report, more polling, as my colleague Selena just mentioned, showing that many American people have concerns about that. Look, I got this question last week as well, and I'm just going to say what the what uh, Dr. O'Connor, it's kind of a, uh, what he said to me about a year ago, uh, when the report came out last year, uh, obviously on his physical, uh, which is the president proves every day how he operates, how he thinks, right? Yeah, he sure does prove it every day. We see it every day. In fact, it's material right here, sometimes humorous material, but most of the time terrifying material. Yeah, he proves exactly how he operates every day. That's not really a direct answer to the question, is it? Also, did you notice how he's citing the fact, she's citing the fact that she's able to ask the president's physician, Dr. O'Connor, about the president's health, about his abilities. He can follow, she can follow up and ask questions of the doctor. She can challenge the doctor. She can get details. She's the White House communications director and she's able, or the press secretary, she's able to actually engage with Joe Biden's doctor. Guess who isn't allowed to do that? You're not allowed to do that. Neither are your representatives on Capitol Hill. Neither are your de facto representatives in the media. Theoretically, they ask questions on behalf of the American people. They're speaking truth to power. This, this whole pretense of transparency and accessibility, and of course we'll let you know, of course, of course, of course. How come Karine Jean-Pierre gets to talk to the president's doctor, but we, through our representatives or through the media, we don't get to talk to the president's doctor? Why is that? But by dealing with world leaders, by making really difficult decisions on behalf of the, the American people, whether it's domestic, whether it's national security. And so he shows it every day on how he thinks, how he operates. Uh, and so that is how uh, that is how the, Dr. O'Connor sees it. And that's how I'm going to leave it. What do you think about the idea of taking that kind of a test? I mean, look, uh, and I talked about this last week, too, on, on I believe when, on Friday. Uh, I have known this president since 2009. Uh, I, he is not just uh, my my boss, but, you know. He's also some a mentor to me, and I spent sometimes countless hours with him. Whether it's in the Oval Office, uh, whether it's on the road, and I believe for me, you're asking me my personal opinion. Uh, he is sharp. Uh, he is on top of things. He when we have. I just want to be clear here. The question was not about her personal opinion. Please, Green, tell me what you think of the president's abilities and his cognitive competency. No, that, that wasn't the question. The question was, what do you think about the president taking a cognitive test? Hey, everybody, Karine Jean-Pierre assures you that Joe Biden's just fine. She's worked with him since 2009. He's a mentor to her, so she wouldn't lie. 
this is outrageous that this is even tolerated in the press room, considering how they behaved when it was uh, Kaylee McEnany or Sarah Huckabee Sanders or Sean Spicer at that podium. They're so polite. And they take this garbage that's ladled to them like it's a turkey dinner. The question is, what do you think of the president taking a cognitive test right now? Considering the fact a U.S. attorney just filed a document in a U.S. federal court saying that he's incapable because of his memory lapses of defending himself in a criminal trial. And her answer is, listen, I've worked with him. He seems fine to me. Have, uh, meetings with him, with his staff. He's constantly pushing us, getting, trying to get more information. And so that has been my experience with this president. Uh, anything else outside of that, uh, I just shared with you what Dr. O'Connor said to me. Uh, and so I'll just leave it there. I feel better. I know you do too. All right. Uh, one more question and a follow-up there at that press briefing, specifically about the cognitive test, because this entire physical exam, well, I'll get to my speculation on what's really going on at Walter Reed in just a second here. Uh, doctor, when can we talk to the president's doctor and how come he hasn't been or they haven't been asked to come out here and talk with us, given the, the her report that challenges the president's mental fitness? So, look, uh, you know, just to speak to uh, the her report really, really quickly. Uh, special counsel of her is, is, as far as I remember, is a is a uh, obviously a, re a Republican, a a a. Uh, a prosecutor, he's not a, he's not a medical doctor. He's just not. So bring the medical doctor out. Do you like how she starts with Robert Hur is a Republican? So, you know, right there, you know how they are. Uh, feel the unity here brought to us by President Unity. President, bring us all together. President, heal our wounds. Well, here's the first thing you need to know about Robert Hur. He's a freaking Republican. So, you know, he should burn in hell. These people are detestable, honestly. They really are. But understand, the question was, and it seems kind of legit. Mr. Hurd, the U.S. attorney, just filed a, a document in federal court saying that the president is incapable of defending himself because of his horrible memory. Why can't we talk to his doctor about that? And suddenly it becomes a partisan attack on the U.S. attorney, which last I checked, when Donald Trump does it, it threatens our very democracy. It's not for him to speak to. It's just not. And uh, and you've heard from uh, over over the past couple of days since the report has been out, uh, you've heard from legal experts from across the ideological spectrum, even uh, in, uh, former attorney general. And he says, and they have come out to say that the stuff in this report uh, that is capturing all of your attention right now is just wrong. It's flatly wrong. It is inappropriate. It is gratuitous. And so going to leave that there. And it is uh, obviously up for uh, a medical doctor to decide on that. But look, I have said the pres the, the medical doctor, the, the president's doctor is going to do a physical. He's going to, and he has always put forth in the last two years, a detailed, uh, detailed memo on the president's, uh, on the president's, uh, uh, obviously, uh, 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 medical uh, physical. And so I'm just going to leave it there. I don't have anything else to add. Go ahead. God, she's good. Uh, listen, here's what's happening. Uh, Dr. O'Connor, who's doing the physical now, apparently the president's doctor, uh, you just heard he's going to put out a detailed memo explaining exactly what the president's health is. And uh, there's no word as to whether he'll take a cognitive test or not. But here's what's going to happen. We know Joe Biden's not going to be the nominee in November. I think that's been determined. The only question is how they get out of this. How they get him off the ticket whether he fully resigns from the office right now or not, or whether he just decides he's not up for four more years. Uh, they have to wait, I think, until after Super Tuesday, which is coming up next Tuesday. And then they'll be able to say, well, it's too far into the primary and caucus process to let the people decide who the Democrats nominee should be. So we'll take that up at the convention. And I think in this doctor's report, they're going to find something. It'll have nothing to do with his cognitive abilities. They can't concede that. They can't concede the fact that what you and I see on a regular basis is true and reality. They have to keep the, the, the facade, the lie going. They'll never, ever admit what you know to be true, uh, partly because they can't possibly 
concede that he should have never been put up for office in the first place and certainly shouldn't continue in office. And also, secondly, I think that they actually get a cheap, gross thrill out of lying to you to your face and forcing you to take it because you can't do anything about it. But they're going to find something. This is going to be extraordinary, extraordinary couple of months ahead of us as we see the future of the presidency determined by a small handful of people deciding who's going to run against Donald Trump this November instead of Joe Biden. But that's why they're making such a big show out of this physical. That's why it's happening right now. Uh, this is where it begins. This is where, and it may be so drastic and there may be so much internal fighting going on right now that they might have to have him step down from the presidency itself so that Kamala Harris can assume the throne and run as an incumbent president rather than as a punchline vice president. Because the kind of luster and honeymoon that she's going to get from being the first black woman president in American history, uh, that kind of media wave that she'll get over the next several months could, in fact, push against the obvious negatives that people feel about her and help her out in November. And if it's not her, well, that's the internal fight that's going on. right now. But ultimately, that's what's happening. And it's happening right before your very eyes. And you can tell how much they're lying about it because they, well, they stutter every single moment they can. I mean, look at, look at Strange Jump here. She's paid to speak. It's her job. President's, uh, on the president's, uh, uh, obviously, uh, 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 medical, uh, physical. And so I'm just going to leave it there. I don't have. Yeah, she, she sounds genuine. She seems like she's telling the truth. No indication there that she's hiding anything. Just watch. Just watch. That's what's happening. Uh, meanwhile, the attempt to undermine, if not imprison and remove Donald Trump from the Republican ticket continues, not just with the Jack Smith special prosecutor investigation into January 6th and the documents case, but also, of course, the ongoing charges in New York. And then there's Fulton County, Georgia, with Fannie Willis. The hearing to determine whether Fannie Willis has a conflict of interest with the special prosecutor that she's sleeping with, whom she hired, uh, funneled hundreds of thousands of dollars to, and then ended up receiving a lot of that money back in the form of luxury vacations and gifts. Uh, well, that hearing continued yesterday uh, because Mr. Wade, the man in question here, the, the uh, special prosecutor that was hired by Fannie Willis, uh, his divorce lawyer was back on the stand. Now, he pled the fifth. Well, excuse me. Sorry. He did not plead the fifth. He pled attorney-client privilege when asked about the relationship and when it began because he is Mr. Wade's divorce attorney. Well, over the weekend, the judge determined that some of the communications that he had with his client or about his client was not covered by attorney-client privilege, and so he was back on the stand. And it was almost as entertaining as the first go around with this story last week. Here's uh, Mr. Uh, Mitchell, uh, Mr. excuse me, Mr. Bradley. Here is Mr. Bradley, the defense attorney, or excuse me, gosh, come on, O'Connor. This is Mr. Bradley, the divorce attorney for Mr. Wade. And uh, as he's reading through some text messages that he sent regarding the relationship, You'll just hear under his breath, it's a slight whisper, but you can hear it. He realizes that he's been caught or his text messages reveal the truth that that Willis and Wade have lied under oath about the beginning of their relationship. And you'll hear him as he recognizes it. You'll hear him say, oh, dang. Watch. Based on what you've just said, let's go to the, what was Defense Exhibit 26. Okay. In Defense Exhibit 26, which I showed you last time, was two pages of text messages between you and Ms. Merchant, correct? Correct. All right. Now, the first page starts off by saying, Ms. Merchant, like, just date, don't hire him. Do you think it started before she hired him? You see that? Did you did you catch that? 
this is the conversation that he's having with somebody else, right? Who is aware of the relationship, Ms. Merchant. And so it's not covered by attorney client privilege, of course, because he's not talking to his client. And he's asking, do you think this relationship started before she hired him? <laughs> as he's looking at it, as he's reading the transcripts of the text, he just does it. The, the, the realization hits him. Dang. Oh, I'm burning this whole thing down, aren't I? Yes, I see it. Yes. And your response to that was absolutely I correct. I'm going to object, ask and answer in a few months. All right. So, um, Mr. Sato, uh, I, I do think we went through a lot of these texts. We, we didn't go through this whole just one. A, just a second, Mr. Sato. All right. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Sato. Well, uh, you said we didn't go through this particular one? No, we went through. We stopped right there. I uh, want to go. I, I went. I answered. Because she, this so is the exact language not... that she just stated a few minutes ago. You can read it back. Okay, Mr. Sato. Are you saying both of these two exhibits weren't already covered by Ms. Merchant? It was not gone. This particular language. All right. So, so uh, listen, we're going to go through some more details of what happened yesterday. That's kind of a major deal. It's a text message exchange where he, the defense attorney, acknowledges definitely, that's the word he used, definitely, that the relationship began before she hired him. Now, that actually proves that they lied. And, and I want to just tell you, the judge only has to declare that there is an appearance of conflict of interest to remove Fannie Willis and most of the lawyers who are prosecuting Donald Trump and his whole team of lawyers and advisors. He only needs a conflict, a, an appearance of conflict to make that ruling. There's well beyond an appearance. There's literal conflict here. I would argue that there's conflict just because they're having a sexual relationship at all, let alone whether they were having that relationship before she hired the special prosecutor in this case. Uh, but they have also sworn under oath that they did not start that relationship ahead of time. That then means that they perjured themselves and tried to to deceive the court, that should bring criminal prosecutions and, frankly, uh, forced removal as district attorney and certainly stop this case in its tracks. And we're going to go through more details of this so you can see exactly what this looks like. But, but can we just pause for a second and remind ourselves once again that this is the clown car that is currently holding the presidential election hostage this November. These people, this guy, and Fannie Willis, and and Wade, and 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 these these fools, they're the ones who are putting themselves in a position to determine whether you will have the opportunity to vote for Donald Trump or not. What the hell is going on in our country that this is even possible? Uh, but there's more. Take a look at this from yesterday. <laughs> When you told me that it started when you left, when she left the DA's office and was a judge in South Fulton, where did you gain that knowledge from? Well, I'm going to object because his testimony a few minutes ago is that he did not recall making that statement. Right, I'll overrule that. Mr. Bradley, answer the question if you can. I also, sorry, I, I'm going to let you finish there, but uh, Mr. Bradley, but I do want to uh, point, I need you to notice something. Uh, two things are happening here that, that require your attention. Every time a question is asked by the lawyers here, Mike Roman, who are trying, one of the co-defendants who's trying to remove uh, D.A. Willis because of this conflict of interest, this witness, the divorce lawyer, uh, pauses. is a nice long pause. Now, part of that is because he's trying to get his story straight before he answers. It's a bit of a tell when somebody's lying. If any of you have children and you know they've done something naughty, and you ask them about it, and they stall and hem and haw, or maybe just not say anything until you ask a second time, that sort of thing. That's what we're seeing here. But he's also coordinating with the defense attorneys. He's coordinating here. He's waiting for the lawyer to come and object. You'll see, because eventually, uh, the Roman's lawyer actually calls him on it, that he sits there and waits. He's like, he's like coordinating his timing on these questions and answers so he doesn't answer until an objection is made. Watch. Now, that objection was overruled. Repeat the question. <clears throat> when you told me 
that their relationship started when she left the DA's office and was a judge in South Fulton. Where did you obtain that knowledge from? It was, I was speculating. Um, I didn't have a, um, No one told me I was speculating. No one told you that? No one told me that. You were speculating based on things that had been told to you or things you had observed? So I'm going to object as to uh, the nature of uh, this line of questioning because the witness has made it clear he was speculating as to how or what he knew. And if it's speculation, it's inadmissible before this court. All right. But the motivations for his reason for speculating would be admissible. So I'll overrule that. Thank you, Judge. Was this speculation when you told me that? Was that based on things that had been told to you and things that you had witnessed? I never witnessed anything. Right. So, um, you know, it, it was speculation. I can't tell you um, anything specific, if that's what you're, you're asking. You All right. So, again, and I want you to evaluate this. You, you, you watch this proceeding and you ask yourself the fundamental question. Is this person trustworthy? Is this person reliable? Is this person telling the truth? And understand that the the questioning right now has to do with, you were asked this thing, you said that thing, we now know that's not true, so what's the deal? And here he says, oh, well, I didn't know for sure, I was just speculating. Of course, he never said that when he answered the question the first time, that he was speculating. And it just so happens that his speculation helps out Mr. Wade and Ms. Willis in trying to stay on the case and and avoid removal because of their obvious conflict of interest. So he's caught, he's trapped, and he's doing whatever he can to try to do damage control here. And ask yourself, does he seem trustworthy to you? Does he seem like he's telling the truth? Can't tell me anything specific as to why you speculated about that? No, this was however many years ago. I mean, I don't recall, but no, I, I don't. Did you have any reason to lie? I don't know if speculation is lying, but I'm... Well, let, let me just... Talk. Show me where in this text it says you're speculating. You didn't ask me if I was speculating or guessing. I didn't ask you, but tell me if it says anywhere here. That no, it, speculation. if this is the same one that you just showed me, it does not. And you're welcome if you need to to look at your text. Um, is there anywhere in here that indicates that you didn't have knowledge of the no. knowledge? Your Honor, I'm going to object. The line of questioning your Honor directed counsel to uh, explore is where he got the knowledge. He's explored that. He said it's speculation, and he didn't get it from any source other than his own speculation. Sure. So I, think I, I think we're flushing that out, and uh, I think it's her right to have a little leeway on this if he's an adverse witness. Uh, so you see how this went. And there was more to it, in fact. He wasn't an adverse witness. And there was a lot uh, here in this hearing yesterday where uh, Mr. Bradley was, in fact, caught in lies that he now, as you can see on his face, is sweating through trying to do damage control to help out his pals. Here's a little more. Mr. Bradley, when you were communicating different details of the relationship between Ms. Willis and Mr. Wade, to Mrs. Merchant, did you lie to her about any of those details? Objection. Asked and answered twice. Uh, I don't think he's answered yet. I don't recall ever um, whether any of it was a lie or not. Well, let's let's just dissect that answer for a second. Again, this is a lawyer, a lawyer who is testifying under oath. A lawyer as an officer of the court who, in these engagements, was acting as the divorce attorney for Mr. Wade in question here, and was asked, when you said these things, were you lying? And he says, he doesn't say, well, no, of course not, I wouldn't lie. Or it would be unethical for me to lie in the duties as an attorney in this proceeding. Or of course I didn't lie. The answer is, I don't recall whether it was a lie or not. In other words, I mean, knowing me could be a lie. Who remembers? I've told so many. Again, not, not necessarily the testimony 
that's going to bring home a win here after all. It just gets worse and worse. And Judge, I just want for the record, because sometimes the record doesn't reflect where people are looking, and that when I ask a question, Mr. Bradley is looking at Mr. Wade and his lawyer to wait for them to object, and they're clearly interacting somehow in the court. So I just want the ref record to reflect that, because it wouldn't otherwise. Yeah, that's what I sort of informed you of, and I'm glad that she actually uh, drew attention to that. There is obvious coordination going on here. Uh, and one last little bit here, just so you get a flavor of exactly how insane this is and how outrageous it is that these are the people who hold our presidential election in their hands. How do you have knowledge? What knowledge? Well, you just told us. You told us Mr. Wade told you. So tell us what Mr. Wade told you about Ms. Willis and Mr. Wade meeting at the Evans office. Uh, objection, Your Honor. Privilege. This clearly covers a time after December 2018 that covered by the privilege. Yeah. Um, overall. You recall the question, Mr. Bradley? I do not. Right. You re-asked the question, Ms. Merchant. What? Wait, do you notice do you notice again the pattern that I already told you stolen for time? So first he waits and waits and waits, then the objection then the overruling, and then he waits and waits and waits. He gets the question asked again. He's really trying hard to come up with the answers here. This is so damaging. This is, and the judge, you know, that's just the judge. There's no jury seeing this. The judge has got to see through this, right? Listen, if the judge decides to let these people stay on this case, it's for purely political reasons. This is, well, I'll get to that in a minute. You got to watch the rest of this one, and then I'll give you my wrap up. What did you learn from Mr. Wade? I was clarified that's where you learned it from. About Mr. Willis, Mr. Wade and Miss Willis meeting at the Evans office together. I don't object to ask and answer. He's testified that he hasn't time. answered. He haven't, we haven't heard an answer. He testified he had one conversation with Mr. Wade in the back of his uh, law Judge, office. No, and, his, and his answer may change. So, uh, office to what, how to answer the question. I can't recall what the conversation was. Um, I do. I do recall um, knowing that they would that he would go down to the office or had been down to the office, but I can't tell you in what capacity or when or any of that, no. Mr. Wade told you that they had sex at the office, though, correct? I don't recall him saying that, no. You don't recall it? No. So it's possible he did say that? You just don't remember one way or another? I do not remember him saying that. Um, <sighs> um guys. I, just quick question. I, ask yourself that if, if a friend of yours told you that he would go down and meet his girlfriend at an office and they would have sex in the office together, would you remember that? Would that stick with you? Would it be something that, you know, a couple years later, and, and actually we're only talking about a year later. If someone said, hey, did, did, did you know, did, did, did he tell you that they had sex in the office? Would you be like, oh, I can't remember. I couldn't tell you one way or the other. Does that, it rings a bell? No, not really. No. Seriously? Yeah. Unless there's so many people telling this guy about how much sex they're having with their girlfriends in their offices. Or someone else's office, for that matter. Unless that's, unless that's so ubiquitous in his life, how is I don't recall even a possible answer to this question? It's either, oh, yeah, he told me about that, or of course not. I'd remember something like that, wouldn't you? So they're lying. They've been lying. And, uh, and now it's up to the judge. The judge has to make a determination here, unless we see more witnesses here in this hearing, which, God, I hope we do. The judge has to decide whether there is an appearance of a conflict of interest. That's how low the bar is here. And it seems pretty obvious that there is, in fact, 
an appearance of conflict of interest. So what do we do with that exactly? If the judge decides not to remove Fannie Willis from this case, if the judge decides that there is no appearance of conflict of interest in the charges and trial against Donald Trump and what is it, 1819 of his advisors and lawyers, if it goes forward, there's only one explanation. This judge is terrified of what's going to happen to him. He is terrified of being called racist. He's terrified of being called a MAGA fascist. He's terrified of losing his election because in Georgia, you vote for Superior Court judges like this. And he is up for re-election, I'm told, I think later this year. This judge knows exactly what's going on here. And this judge may rationalize it in his brain by saying, you know what? This is a perfect thing for them to take up on appeal and we'll let an appeals court handling, but I'm not going to get away of this. I don't need that. I don't need to be a part of history. I don't need to be a, any part of the crap show that will shower down upon me if I inject myself into this. So I'm going to go through the process. I'll do due diligence. And then I'll be able to say, no, for the, for the purposes of justice and the American way, we're going to see this through and we'll let the appeals court take it up. And if that's what happens, if that's what they do, you know exactly, exactly what we're dealing with here. And what's at play? And God help us all. Meanwhile, on Capitol Hill, as we speak, Hunter Biden is giving testimony behind closed doors to the House Oversight and House Judiciary Committees. This has been long delayed and negotiated. You remember Hunter Biden wanted public testimony, so he defied the subpoena that was given to him. They finally negotiated this arrangement. And the Oversight Committee chairman, James Comer, gave a press conference right before the hearings took place. And um, I want to show you one part of it because he had to deal with this loud, obnoxious, half-crazed activist who was trying to heckle him and scream him down there out in front of the hearing room. Here, watch. Mr. Chairman, what evidence do you have that either as vice president or as president, Joe Biden used his political office in any way to benefit either Hunter or James Biden's business deal. We have evidence that uh, Joe Biden met with the Chinese. But officials. what specific actions did he take? We've as had a public several official? people already testify. But what action? How did? How was America or help? Oh, I, 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 I'm so sorry. The screaming, yelling activist, lunatic protester is actually a reporter, a political reporter in the D.C. press pool. My mistake. It's an understandable mistake, though, isn't it? Watch. How is this Chinese business helped by the fact that Joe so, Biden so, was vice okay, president? So, so let me ask you a question. It, you mentioned AmeriCorps Health. Does anyone in here question whether or not that was influence pedal? Does anyone question that? I think no. There's a lot of questions about it, sir, because there was no evidence that Joe Biden did anything. He got $200,000 from it. What did he do and as the a public official? That, that, Joe, that Jim Didn't Biden said, checks, Joe, no, listen. He wasn't vice president at the Look, time those checks can, were passed. You can you can defend Joe Biden I'm not all day long. You can you, defend Joe Biden. You, you, can be, you can be on his legal defense team. Kevin Morris will probably pay your legal bills <laughs> if you want. You're not but answering the, my question. No, I am answering your question. You don't, you, you don't understand what we've said over and over and over. Joe Biden took two hundred thousand dollars. Was he vice president from at the time that two hundred thousand dollar check was was put through? The what? He was a private citizen at the time that two hundred thousand dollar check went through. Was he not? The the four hundred the forty thousand dollars. The two hundred thousand dollar check, which you've cited twice. So now, it's okay. Was he a public official so, at the time? So, so do you have a problem that Joe Biden's lied about this? Do you have a problem that that America? I have any evidence that he's lied about investors? it. I'm asking you, what specific? Action did he take as a public official, an elected public official? Well, that with led the, yeah, those with the, with the, with if the, you have that evidence, yeah, sir, okay, okay, calm it. down, calm down. It's okay. No, it's I'm okay. Not. All the angry liberals are what you're saying. They'll, they'll be all right. Okay. All right, listen. Have you ever seen a reporter asking a question of Chuck Schumer or Nancy Pelosi or Joe Biden in any way whatsoever? Like that reporter was just grilling James Comer. That is obnoxious. It's hard. This is what they have to deal with on a daily basis. And by the way, the questioning that you just saw there, what you just witnessed is the bar and the goalposts being moved all around the field now. It, 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 notice when this happens, the narrative shifts. See, first it was I never talked to my son about any of his business dealings. Then I was never involved with my son in any of his business dealings. And then it, I never participated 
in any of my son's business dealings. Then it was, I never profited from any of my son's business dealings. Then it was, I've never been in business with my son, which is a very distinct legal difference. And now finally, the goalposts have been moved so far across the field that it's not even in bounds anymore. They've moved the goalposts actually onto a different field. It is no longer a football field. It's now maybe a soccer field. Because now the goalposts say, what specific action did Joe Biden take that benefited these companies that paid him and his family? And I just need you to know, because it's critically important, as you see this narrative shift in that direction, that the law doesn't care about that. You don't have to prove that any action was taken in exchange for money you received for access or influence in Washington, D.C. All that has to be proven is money was exchanged. And it doesn't even have to be money that came to you. It can be money that went to your son or to your brother or to your nieces and your nephews. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. If you or your family makes money or benefit by them selling influence and access to you, game over. Game over. But now they're changing the narratives, as you just saw before your eyes, to such a drastic level to say, oh, no, no, you can't point to one specific action that this person took in exchange for that money. Boy, and let me tell you something. If that were the rule of law with regard to public corruption, Nobody would ever get arrested, let alone prosecuted for this kind of thing. Not that many people ever do, you know, because the lawmakers write the laws that protect them from such a thing. Uh, that said, earlier today, right after that press conference, about an hour and a half, two hours ago, Hunter Biden arrived on Capitol here. Here was the scene. Uh, Jim Jordan just went through the main door. Uh, we're staking out, obviously, position. Um, he's expected in the next eight minutes. So um, maybe this is maybe this is him. All right, here he is. All right, Hunter Biden arriving on Capitol Hill. All right. Didn't take any questions. Answer any questions. Remember, you go back to the moment when Hillary Vaughn was able to stop him in the hallway. Let's listen yeah, here. There's a series of cameras set up, so they're just get the relays here, one after the other. And we'll see whether or not there's any commentary that's given. <laughs> um, when James Biden testified, I think he went in at a similar time, 10 a.m. I think he was still there after 7 o'clock at night. Uh, so that, that, that's nine hours, not including a lunch break. And uh, here we go. Hunter, picking up what do you hope account. to tell the committee today? Mr. Biden. That might be the last relay. Let's see. Um, <laughs> Carrie's still with us. The moment he hired his attorney, who was by his side there, Abby Lowell, mm -hmm. that seemed to get the attention of a lot of people in Washington. Yeah, that's right, because Abby Lowell is the cleanup artist. He is the person that you call when you're in deep doo-doo. And that's exactly who is helping him out today on Capitol Hill. So, yes, he's behind closed doors right now. Uh, there will be leaks about this deposition. There will be plenty of things that will be put out in front of the public. And hopefully, maybe we'll actually get a public testimony at some point. That often happens. They testify behind closed doors, and then they come and testify in public. Uh, this is how these committees have set things up. They've already talked to pretty much every single possible witness with any kind of knowledge about what business Hunter Biden was in and what he did to make his money, which, by the way, is the most fundamental question here. Uh, we know he made tons of money. We know that most of it came from foreign influences, from governments that are oftentimes hostile to this country. And the money was flowing in from various interests, energy companies uh, and such. And uh, one must always ask the question here that is so fundamental to this case because it gets lost. It gets lost in the politics. But the question needs to be asked. When you make money in business, you are selling a product or you are selling a service. That's just the fundamental realities of, of economics, of a free market. If you are making money 
in business, it's because you're selling a product or you're selling a service. Now, right now, Hunter Biden makes money selling art. That's his product, supposedly, and he makes quite a bit of money doing it. At the time, though, he was selling a service. They like to euphemistically call it the brand, the Biden brand. And so the question that every single American should be asking themselves, and hopefully will come up in the congressional testimony here, is if you were selling the Biden brand, what exactly does that mean? Was it your expertise? Was it your Uncle James' expertise? Was it your sister-in-law's expertise? I mean, if Joe Biden wasn't the vice president, how much exactly would the Biden brand be worth? Fundamentally, what is it Joe, what is it Hunter Biden sold to his clients? And the answer is obvious on the face of it. You don't even need to see the evidence. The answer is obvious. He was selling his dad. It makes him Joe Biden's pimp. He was selling his dad on the other end of a conference call on the speakerphone when the client was sitting in the office. He was selling his dad coming into the restaurant with his vice presidential motorcade in Georgetown on his way home. He was selling his dad on the golf course with his clients for a foursome, just a nice, friendly 18 rounds of golf. You see, we have evidence that all of those things happen. The phone call on the speakerphone, the drop by to the restaurant in Georgetown and the golf games. There's photographic evidence of all of it. We know that Joe Biden went out of his way to visit and greet his son at the very moment he had a million dollar client right there with him because Joe Biden was the brand. Joe Biden was the product. And we have testimony from former business partners. We have testimony from clients. We have testimony from James Biden, the brother and one of the business partners here. We have bank records of transactions and canceled checks that have been passed through over 20 different shell companies to hide the money. And now finally, you bring in the last guy, Hunter Biden. This is how a prosecution works. And you ask all of the questions of Hunter Biden to corroborate or to contradict all of the testimony you've already heard. Now, if Hunter Biden is smart, most of what he will say today is the Fifth Amendment. He will recite the words of the Fifth Amendment. But you need to know something. As far as politics are concerned, everything that we've learned about the Biden family and their corruption, it needs to be measured against one thing, and that was a minute and a half of the debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden with Chris Wallace as the moderator back in October of 2020. Uh, I want you to see it because I'm, I'm about to read Hunter Biden's statement. We do have that. He has distributed the written statement that he has prepared and that what he will read before the committee today. But before I read that, I need you to see this moment. It's a minute and a half long. This was the debate when Donald Trump raised the issue of Hunter Biden. I want you to listen to everything Joe Biden says here to win your vote. Everything that Joe Biden said at this critical moment to get this story out of the way so he could become president of the United States. And I want you to compare it to everything that we've learned since then. He got thrown out of the military. He was thrown out, dishonorably discharged. That's not true. For he wasn't dishonorably. cocaine use. And he didn't have a job until you became vice president. Once you None became of that vice president, true. he made a fortune in Ukraine, in China, in Moscow, that is simply and various not other places. True. He my made son, a fortune. Gentlemen, my son. And he didn't have a job. My son, like a lot of people, like a lot of people we know at home, had a drug problem. He's overtaken it. He's, he's, he's fixed it. He's worked on it. And I'm proud of him. But why I'm was he given tens son. of millions All right. of dollars? But he wasn't given right. tens of millions of dollars. That is totally, that's been Trump. totally President discredited. Trump. You've, already, this, we've already been through totally we've already discredited. We've, both, we've already been through this. I think the American people would rather hear about more substantial so subjects. Well, you know, as the moderator, sir, I'm going to make a, know, a judgment call here. I know, but three and a half million okay, dollars right. from the let's mayor talk about, of Moscow, let's that talk is about not true. That report is totally discredited. I, I 
I Mitt think, Romney on that committee said it wasn't worth taxpayers' John, money, that report. It was written for political you, reasons. You know. All right. So uh, that was Chris Wallace. God bless him. Doing really, really good work on behalf of Joe Biden. And when you watch that, don't you get ticked off? I know I do. I think the American people would rather hear about other things. Really? I'd like to know if Joe Biden's a crook, and I would like to keep hearing him deny this, because every single time in that clip just now, he said, that's not true, that's not true, that's been discredited. He was lying. Of course, his son made millions and millions of dollars from Ukraine, from Moscow, and from China. That's absolute fact. In fact, Joe Biden's own Department of Justice in a U.S. attorney's filing with 10 different IRS charges against Hunter Biden have actually stated that in open court now. So when Joe Biden says that's not true, that's not true, I guess he's saying that his own Justice Department is lying. That's how they won the election. Or, well, one of the ways they secured the results, let's say. And part of it was Chris Wallace. Part of it was the media assist at that moment. Chris Wallace supposedly a well-respected journalist I keep hearing from people, who was so incurious about that story that he decided to buy the Biden denials and buy the fake report from 51 intelligence community professionals that it was really Russian disinformation. Honestly, I'm more angry and outraged at Chris Wallace in that entire escapade than anyone else on that stage. Here's the statement that Hunter Biden will read today to the House Oversight Committee. If you know anyone in your life, by the way, who is an addict and a liar, a serial liar, and the two usually go hand in hand, listen to this. And you tell me if you see a pattern of behavior. I'm here today to provide the committees with the one uncontestable fact that should end the false premise of this inquiry. I did not involve my father in my business. Let me pause there for a minute. That's not what his dad has said. His dad has said that he didn't know anything about his business. His dad has said that he never talked to Hunter about his business. And now the new line is, I never involved my father in my business. But of course, we know that's not true too. We know that's not true because of the evidence that we've seen of him going out of his way to make sure that his father was, in fact, on the other end of the phone and what have you. I did not involve my father in my business, not while I was a practicing lawyer, not in my investments or transactions, domestic or international, not as a board member and not as an artist. Never. You read this fact in the many letters that have been sent to you over the last year as part of your so-called impeachment investigation. You heard this fact when I said it weeks ago, standing outside of this building. You heard this fact from a parade of business partners of mine, including my uncle, who have testified before you in similar proceedings. And now today, you hear this fact directly from me. For more than a year, your committee has hunted me in your partisan political pursuit of my dad. You have trafficked in innuendo, distortion, and sensationalism all the while ignoring the clear and convincing evidence staring you in the face. You do not have evidence to support the baseless and MAGA-motivated conspiracies about my father because there isn't any. You know, if you're trying to just tell the truth and not delve into politics or make your defense or excuses before this committee anything but the bare-bones legal facts, and, and, and anything but a political circus, maybe you should drop the MAGA stuff from your statement. Just a pro tip there. The second you throw the MAGA thing out there, it seems like you're being a little political. You have built your entire partisan house of cards on lies told by the likes of Gal Luft, Tony Bobulinski, Alexander Smirnoff, and Jason Galanis. Uh, just for a moment, he's about to smear all of those people. Other than Smirnoff, all of those people he just cited are people. They're horrible human beings. They're deceitful. You can't trust them. They're disgusting. They're also people Hunter Biden did business with. So, you know, take that into account. 
Luft, who is a fugitive, has been indicted for his his lies and other crimes. Smirnov, who has made you dupes in carrying out a Russian disinformation campaign. There we go, Russian disinformation waged against my father, has been indicted for his lies. Bobolinsky, who has been exposed for the many false statements he has made. And Galanis, who is serving 14 years in prison for fraud. Wow, why'd you do business with him then, Hunter? You've got terrible taste in friends, don't you? They're disgusting and despicable individuals when they're witnesses before this committee. But, you know, when, when they're potential business partners, I this is a hell of a guy. He's my best friend. Oh, you, we should do business together. Rather than follow the facts as they have been laid out before you in bank records, financial statements, correspondence, and other witness testimony, you continue your frantic search to prove the lies you and those you rely on keep peddling. Yes, they are lies. To be clear, I have made many mistakes in my life, and I have squandered opportunities and privileges that were afforded to me. I don't know. Seems to me that he took advantage of every opportunity put in front of him. Dude made millions of dollars with no actual discernible skills whatsoever. Dude was raking in the bucks and living high on the hog. And what did he bring to the table? Well, he was born right. Honestly, the greatest achievement this guy ever has in his entire life was over and done on the literal day of his birth. He didn't have to do anything else. It's the Biden brand after all. I, I, I think he's selling himself short when he says he squandered every opportunity. I think he kicked butt with the limited resources that he had. I am responsible for that and I am making amends for that. But my mistakes and shortcomings are my own and not my father's, who has done nothing but devote his entire life to public service and trying to make the country a better place to live. During my battle with addiction, my father was there for me, helped save my life. His love and support made it possible for me to get sober, stay sober, and rebuild my life as a father, husband, son, and brother. Um, I think, objectively speaking, you can look at his father's behavior toward him during his addiction and come to a different conclusion. You could say that he enabled his son, actually. Uh, he never intervened and actually got his son out of the lifestyle that he was living. He never said to him, stop. Stop trying to make millions on our name. Stop with the foreign businesses and the foreign connections. Stop with all of this. What are you doing on a board of an energy company in Ukraine? You know nothing about energy and even less about Ukraine. Son, for God's sake, you don't need all of this money. What are you doing with it? Sticking it up your nose? That's what a father says. That's what a father does. He actually enabled him. And the fact that he's still in denial about that for political purposes is sad, really sad. I wish Joe Biden had intervened and tried to save his son's life. Instead, it seemed like he encouraged his son to continue this lifestyle because it was good for the Biden brand. And after all, this is the business we're in. Where else are we going to make money from me? Just a senator. We don't make enough money to pay for all of this. And now Joe Biden has a beautiful beach home and two other houses. And everyone else is doing pretty good, too. I actually sometimes feel sorry for Hunter Biden. Over the last years, Republicans have taken my communications out of context, relied on documents that have been altered and cherry-picked snippets of financial or other records to misrepresent what really happened. Examples of this include a few references to my family and emails or texts that I sent when I was in the darkest days of my addiction. If you try to do that again today, my answers will reveal your tactics and demonstrate the truth that my father was never involved in any of my businesses. My testimony today should put an end to this baselessness and destructive political charade. You have wasted valuable time and resources attacking me and my family for your own political gain when you should be fixing the real problems in this country that desperately need your attention. What real problems? Hunter, come on. Bidenomics is working. No problems going on in this country. In fact, if there are real problems in this country that your dad wants Congress to fix, why is he just having meetings and insisting on Ukraine funding? That's not this country. Oh, why is he so intent on making sure more tax dollars go to Ukraine? Do you know anything about Ukraine, Hunter? Could you shed some light on that, perhaps? Weird. Weird how so much of his criminal wrongdoing is connected to Ukraine. And at the same time, it's Joe Biden's main priority. It's almost like Biden cares more about Ukraine than he does about our own border. 
and our own people. Could there be a connection there? We'll just have to wait and see how this testimony goes. As you know, we love investigative journalism, real investigative journalism, not you know people who work for the Washington Post who get handed a manila envelope by somebody who works at the FBI, and then they publish it even though it's all fake because it's about Russia and Trump. Not that kind of investigative journalism, real investigative journalism. And one of our favorite investigative journalists working out there right now is Gabe Kaminsky, over at the Washington Examiner, and he's got a bombshell. Gabe Kaminsky, thank you for joining us on this story that just broke this morning, right? Yeah. Yeah, thanks for having me, Larry. All right, so let's lay this out here. Uh, we already know that the Biden administration made unbelievable judgment errors in releasing funds to the country of Iran, and that money then went to fund terrorists. And we know that they freed up money for Hamas uh, at the Gaza Strip. But now you have found more money going to terrorists, even though the administration was warned about this organization. Is that right? Lay, lay this out for me. Yeah. So as you said, you know, of course, there's heightened scrutiny with regard to uh, cash uh, domestically in the U.S., right, being funneled to foreign entities that are either linked to terror or in Gaza Strip, which is controlled by Hamas. But yeah, our story this morning details uh, basically uh, uh, are uh, the inspector general for the U.S. Agency for International Development. It's the top foreign aid agency in the U.S., dispersing you know uh, large sums of money each year overseas uh, for initiatives Republicans often you know aren't too fond about. Um, the inspector general for that agency quietly last year launched an investigation into a hundred ten thousand dollar grant in 2021 to a charity in Michigan called uh, Helping Hand for Relief and Development. And that actually raised the concerns at the time, or, or actually rather uh, last year, of Republicans on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And the reason for that is because Helping Hand for Relief and Development uh, has various uh, actual ties to, to terrorism. Uh, and just to give you an example, it's partnered in various occasions with a group in Pakistan called Falah in, in Sinyat which is a partner of a separate uh, Pakistani designated foreign terrorist organization. Uh, and just one other example to give you of this charity, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, partnered with a group called Jamaat e Islami, which is a Islamist foundation whose, whose, uh, whose, whose charity arm has actually wired money directly to Hamas, uh, helping hand for relief uh, uh, development, the, the Biden administration funded group has funded that that group in turn. So all that to say, there are legitimate terror ties that have been on the radar of lawmakers, um, and that we found that the inspector general actually began looking into this after Republicans raised concerns over it. But uh, that actually didn't stop the Biden administration after that investigation was already open from from sending seventy eight thousand dollars in separate money to the same foundation, as there was already you know documented reporting about. Um, uh, uh, those terror ties. And so that's something, you know, we spoke to some lawmakers and former uh, federal officials who say that that the fact that USAID's inspector general would inv would investigate the agency proper yeah. for a grant as small as $110,000 shows that they recognize this is really a problem. So let's unpack this here. Uh, Helping Hand and Relief, that's a Michigan-based uh, charity or, or agency or private NGO, I guess. And they, we already know that they have ties to overseas terror operations. I want to get to that in a minute. USAID, that's the government agency. And you said the inspector general of USAID, uh, they quietly started an investigation of this grant from a year ago. But when you say quietly, you mean it didn't get a lot of media attention. But there's no doubt that the administrators of USAID, the Biden administration, the State Department, they knew that this investigation was going forward, right? Inspector General, generally speaking, uh, alerts these people that something's being investigated. They can't claim ignorance here, can they? So so actually, when I say quietly, I meant no one's, this is the first time anyone's reported on the inspector general right. investigation. It hasn't been publicized before. Um, and I'm not sure who's been made aware of it in the past. Uh, I had reached out to various people on the Hill who seemed completely ignorant to the fact that that could have been going on. And I think a part of that is inspector general's offices operate independently from agencies and uh, uh, sort of operate in a covert fashion. But certainly uh, USAID 
was aware itself that the inspector general had launched an investigation into its grant in 2021 uh to this nonprofit group right okay. and uh and us aid uh they technically could have postponed a, their follow up grant to this charity but they decided not to yeah so us aid knows that there's an investigation at the inspector general level about this last grant that they gave helping hands in Michigan because of their terror ties. And they just go ahead and give more money to them. And by the way, this is this is in light of the terror attacks uh, on October 7th in Israel. Um, Samantha Power, if I remember right, is actually in charge of USAID. People might remember her as the ambassador to the UN under Barack Obama, right? Yeah, right. She's the uh, USAID administrator. So Samantha Power is the uh, you know head USAID official, and she's the individual that uh, in January 2023 had received a letter from the House Foreign Affairs Committee asking USAID to suspend its grant over help to Helping Hands over what they said were credible allegations that the group is associated with terror organizations. Yeah. Um, uh, so certainly, certainly on her radar. And I just want to make sure that everybody understands here, because we're talking about this organization, USAID. It's a government agency. This money that we're talking about is taxpayer dollars. This is U.S. taxpayer dollars that's going to an organization that has ties to terrorists at a time of heightened alarm over terrorist activities around the world and even right here at home. Right. And I think the thing to emphasize here is so USAID is giving money to this, this group that has pretty obvious uh, uh, issues overseas. We looked at other participants in the same grant program that USA gave money to, and they're actually some they're legitimate organizations. They're groups like World Help, which is a Christian humanitarian group, or a Jewish volunteer group called Hadassah, or any or certain groups in Jerusalem. Uh, I'm not saying all these grantees. I don't know where they align morally or politically, but they're not, we haven't find documented ties to terrorists, right? We know we Just, know they're not connected to terrorists. Let's let's right, start there least, as the baseline. Yeah, yeah, that's the baseline, right? So that's that's what we're aware of, and so clearly this is a problem, right? And that's something that we we heard from from people in Congress and uh, foreign policy experts, right? But that didn't stop, uh, you know, six months after USAID's investigation began from saying, oh, well, let's send more taxpayer dollars to this group that, you know, lawmakers uh, told us and has been documented as uh, linked to, you know, groups murdering people. Yeah, there's another part of this story, I think, that it isn't necessarily in your article this morning, Gabe, but I think it's worth exploring. And that is, you know, after the attacks of September 11th, it was discovered through various investigations that there were domestic organizations, nonprofits, NGOs, who did have ties to Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, uh, that became the focus of uh, many prosecutions after those investigations during the Bush administration. You would think that we would still be on high alert about this sort of thing, that there should still be extra scrutiny here. Uh, if, if these guys are on the radar, I mean, listen, it's bad enough that the Biden administration is just willy-nilly giving them tax dollars, Gabe, even after they know they're being investigated right now. But at the same time, shouldn't there be a criminal investigation here? Or are you aware if there is a criminal investigation over an organization tied to terrorists? Yeah, I'm not aware of any uh, criminal investigation. I mean, the USAID inspector general has statutory law enforcement power, subpoena power, and they could bring in the Department of Justice into their investigation. I mean, one notable thing I'd say is in 2019, a man named Farid Ahmed Khan was found guilty by a Connecticut jury uh, making false statements to the FBI in connection to a terrorism financing investigation uh, about being affiliated with this charity funded by the Biden administration and an affiliated group. Uh, uh, he was he went to prison and I'm actually not sure if he's still in prison. It's kind of unclear his whereabouts right now, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. um, but all that has to say, I think you said, you know, since 9-11, there's been heightened scrutiny over terror linked charities. And that's certainly uh, that's a real problem because, you know, as you've seen, I think the tip of the iceberg, right, decades uh, in 2002, the Holy Land Foundation, uh, a right. charity was prosecuted uh, and the Justice Department basically shut this charity down, saying that it was falling money to Al Qaeda and, you know, boosting Osama bin Laden. And since that time, it seems like there's been a lack of oversight in the IRS and other agencies. The Holy Land Foundation has essentially reincorporated into other charities that now share staff of the Holy Land Foundation, places like American Muslims for Palestine, where 
Attorney General Jason Myers is now investigating him, uh, them over over those sort of allegations. So there's certainly many charities like HHRD and the government is no problem funding them. Yeah, that's Virginia Attorney General Jason Myers. He's not U.S. Attorney General quite yet. Oh, though. yeah. Uh, right. is, well, you didn't specify. I want to make sure people do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Also, and you're right. There are organizations like that who are also supporting and funding some of the atrocious pro-Hamas terrorist uh, protests that we're seeing, uh, either on college campuses or in our city streets. All of these things are organized. We can tell they've got printed signs and all of that jazz. Uh, you said that there were members of Congress who weren't actually aware of this. Uh, but has anyone in, on Capitol Hill responded to your report yet? And do they plan on a congressional investigation for what it's worth? Yeah. So, I mean, we saw the House Foreign Affairs Committee, right? They had looked into that 2021 grant. Uh, I reached out to them to see if they were looking into that 2023 grant. They had declined to comment on that front. So I'm not sure where it stands as far as looking into the follow up money. Uh, they might view it as sort of connected to their initial investigation. And maybe it's kind of. Yeah been passed along to the inspector general who's now looking into this grant. But certainly there seems to be, you know, potential interest among uh, certain lawmakers like Daryl Issa in looking into this. Uh, Daryl Issa is, you know, a member who has long time been focused on, uh, you know, terror related issues and yeah. anti-Israel matters. So uh, I think he's a lawmaker to watch. And I also think that the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. This this really would be their jurisdiction as well. Yeah, uh, lawmakers like Ted Cruz are on that, or uh, Marshall Blackburn. Well, you're you're right. In the Daryl Issa, former chairman of the House Oversight Committee, if he's got you on your uh, in his sights, he's definitely going to scrutinize you and put in a thorough investigation. Uh, Gabe, I think that your story will probably actually move it along as well, and we should expect an investigation. One last question: the USAID, this agency that is responsible for <laughs> Again, granting U.S. tax dollars to an organization already being investigated for ties to terrorists overseas in Gaza. Is this under the umbrella of the State Department? Is this on Antony Blinken's watch? Well, so USAID works closely with the State Department. Uh, 2024 budget wise, they both received, I believe it was about uh something like $60 billion combined from Congress through appropriations. Uh, State Department and USAID work together closely in you know regions like India or, or any numbers. So I'd, okay. I'd, I'd hope that the State Department is, is aware of this Inspector General investigation. Uh, I reached out to USAID. We sent them a detailed list of questions weeks ago. They responded to our initial email and then uh, pretty much did not respond to several follow-ups. So uh, I haven't been able to get any clarity out of them. Well, I think you've been doing this long enough to know that when they stop responding, it means you're on the right trail. So we'll trust that you'll continue to pursue it. Gabe Kaminsky, thank you for giving us the details on this disconcerting report. Thanks. That's it for today. A long one, action-packed and breaking news loaded program. We'll be back again next time. Keep it here and make sure you like us. You you subscribe to us, you share whatever segment you loved today, and uh, subscribe to the podcast too. Even if you usually watch the video, just subscribe to the podcast because it helps us out. And after all, you're not paying for this. <laughs> we'll see you next time. My name is Larry O'Connor. You can call me Larry. <laughs>